Well, the Brown season has mercifully come to a close. Man, did they stick this year. And I, despite all the possible predictions, I don't really see how they're going to be good next year. It's today in Ohio, the news podcast discussion from Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer. I'm Chris Quinn. I am here with Lisa Garvin, Laura Johnston, and Layla Tassi. Laura, I liked your summing up about the house and how mm-hmm. you are happy to to be in it and you feel like you're living in their dream home. Yeah, it feels like an Airbnb. Like I really thought that with the heated floors and this giant shower, my kids would be in there all the time and I would be like, get out. But they're really, <laughs> that extra flight of stairs is really keeping them away. So <laughs> it feels like an escape. Like you are just on a different planet and it, it's been so mm-hmm. nice. So it was worth all the pain. It was worth all the pain. I think even my husband's coming around to it. Like, I think he was like, <laughs> we didn't need this. And I was like, oh, this is really nice. So, yeah. Layla, now we just got to figure out a driveway. <laughs> Layla, I may as well ask you, was it worth all the pain? Yeah, it was, worth, it was worth it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, I'll be paying it off till I'm dead, but it'll be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You just forget that part, right? Right. Because it's not in the present. Well, let's get to some news. Is Mike DeWine now the poster child for climate change? Did he actually sign into law a redefinition of natural gas as green energy? All right, this was about the most depressing moment of last week. And he waited until the end of the day Friday to try and cover it up. What did he do? Yeah, just before 5 p.m., he sent out this release about signing the bill. He didn't want to answer questions from reporters about it on Thursday or Friday, because why would you want to answer any questions about declaring natural gas green energy? This bill broadly expands the ability to drill for oil and gas in state parks as well. So it basically says that a state agency shall accept a lease that meets certain conditions and setting it, instead of saying it may do so. So forces the agency to grant any lease op- application from oil and gas drillers, which Mike DeWine has been a huge proponent of state parks. He's been so proud of it. He's put money into them. And just to say, okay, let's do drilling. And by the way, we're green in Ohio because we have natural gas. It's just absurd. Yeah, I I, I think the symbolism of what he did is about as distressing as it gets. And you start to, I mean, look, Mike DeWine has long ties to the energy industry. I mean, he was best friends with First Energy. He was never implicated in the scandal, but he was very close to them throughout his career. And you know, he clearly has ties to the energy industry. But what does this say to kids, right? I mean, it, it, it's so preposterous to do it. And he had a chance to say, look, I'm not going to sign this. This is, I do, I do believe in state parks. Clearly he doesn't. I mean, to, to sign this, which gives the absolute right to drill, it's a horrible sign. And you just wonder, when is there going to be a level of politician that actually is thinking about the kids? Because that's what, what, climate change is about it's about the planet we live for the next leave for the next generations absolutely i I completely agree with you and dewine dewine got immediate blowback from people who basically said that this is a regressive and a fallacy he's embarrassed by it that's why he did this at 5 p.m on a on a friday and that labeling gas as now are Labeling natural gas as green energy is a little bit Orwellian. And you, you, you're right. I mean, Mike DeWine stands up there all the time talking about kids. He talks about his grandkids. He talks about the importance of education and mental health help and and all of the things he's doing for children. But if he cares about the next generation, then let's protect it. And instead of gutting green energy in Ohio – do something a little bit forward thinking. He's in his last term as governor. He just got sworn in again on Sunday and uh, he'll do it again, I think, today. Let's do something for the planet and for the people of Ohio. Right. He didn't, he's not beholden to anybody anymore. He He's not going to run again because he's done. So do the right thing. I, I, I thought that he would do the right thing here. And it's distressing for what this means for his final term. Does this mean that because I'm not beholden, I'm just going to, going to be, you know, a pal to my longtime buddies. Very distressing story. He signed dozens of bills last night, last week. I actually went through and counted. I, I'm not sure that I got everything, but we were at least 38 when I was counting. So, but he, he vetoed one. He vetoed the cigarettes um, and letting cities actually make their own rules. But I mean, that's not a lot of pushback. 
And he also signed the photo voter ID law, mm-hmm. which we've talked about in detail, which didn't surprise anybody. This was the one. This was the one. He could have made a statement. He could have said to kids, I'm doing this for you. We've got to make the planet a good place also, for you. We talk about Intel and wanting people to move here and Ohio being, you know, technologically driven and forward thinking. I mean, do you want to move to a state to work for a company that just declared natural gas green energy? Yeah, I know. distressing. It's today in Ohio. After that story, this next one will surprise no one. With the bulk of the world outside of Ohio working to reduce greenhouse gases to slow down the damage we're doing to the planet, let us ask where Ohio ranks in requiring a move to clean energy. Layla? So this is according to a survey by the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, which conducts research for the U.S. Department of Energy. They say that since the passage of HB6 in 2019, Ohio has had the least stringent clean energy requirements of the 31 U.S. states with a renewable standard. Utilities in Ohio need only 8.5% renewable energy by 2026 to meet state requirements. Other states have adopted 100% zero carbon clean energy requirements by 2050. New Mexico raised its target to 80%. Maryland, Maine, Nevada, they all increased theirs to 50%. Here we are with our measly eight and a half. (laughs) So meanwhile, you know, we got Governor DeWine signing the legislation that Laura just talked about. But, you know, the bottom line is here that we get the smallest share of our energy from renewable sources. And reporter Jake Zuckerman tells us that this is all the result of, of years of whittling away at an already, you know, very meager renewable energy goal. We were one of the very last states to establish a clean energy law in 2008. The law created the renewable portfolio standards in an energy efficiency program, which allowed utilities to charge all rate payers to fund efforts to reduce customers' electricity demand using smart appliances and other energy savers. But as written, 12.5% of a utility's electricity mix were supposed to come from renewables by 2024, half of which was supposed to come from in-state facilities, and 0.5% must be solar. And the law also requires utilities to reduce demand by 20, 22% by 2025. Um, lawmakers back in 2014 delayed for two years the, 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 the law's annual increasing of requirements. And that almost happened again a little while later with a bill that would have made the requirements voluntary until Governor John Kasich at that time vetoed it. And then HB6 weakened the RPS goals and, and killed off the energy efficiency programs. And uh, so that's where we are with our, our little 8.5% renewable energy. <laughs> yeah, that's why the the trial of Larry Householder starting in a couple of weeks is so important. I, we're going to cover that gavel to gavel because it is going to show how state government works hand in hand with the utilities. That's why we're we are where we are. The utilities have owned the state house and they've gotten whatever they want. That trial should give us a real insight into just how bad that is and and hopefully it'll alert Ohioans to the fact that they should make change. I don't understand how they can can require the utilities to reduce the demand if they're advocating everybody get an electric car. Wouldn't that greatly <laughs> increase demand? I hadn't thought of that. What what I thought was really interesting about Jake's story was also that he points out that apart apart from the you know the blatant corruption, <laughs> there's there's another reason why our clean energy goals are lagging, and that's because state law now requires this buffer for wind turbines in Ohio of at least 1,125 feet from their blade tip to the nearest property line, and it seems that this setback is is about two to three times larger than most U.S. states. So. You know that is is an impediment, and uh, and and Ohio law also lets local governments veto specific projects. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so it's it's we're just getting in our own way. We're getting in our own way, and there's no end in sight. And now we've declared natural gas clean energy, so we're we're completely back. We really here. are. It's today in Ohio. Well, after that depressing news, is there hope in Northeast Ohio that someone in this state will do something about climate change? Lisa, what is our regional planning agency doing about it? The Northeast Ohio Area-Wide Coordinating Agency, or NOACA, um, will present a draft climate change plan 
tomorrow, they're going to do it via live stream and they'll have a live feed at six area community colleges and libraries. That'll be from 5.30 to 7.30 tomorrow. Uh, the public can ask questions and they su can suggest changes to the plan. So the plan is looking at greenhouse gas emissions, specifically carbon dioxide and methane. And they want to determine where the climate change risks are the most are in the most urgent and they want to make people places and infrastructure more resilient to impacts from climate change. Now they've already completed phase one. So they did an inventory of greenhouse gases in the, in the, the greater, you know, the Northeast Ohio area. Surprisingly, the number one emitter is residential homes and apartments. Those that have natural gas, propane, and fuel oil, that was 25.7% of the greenhouse gas inventory. Number two was transportation, just slightly behind at 25.5%. Number three, industrial energy, only 19.5%. I was surprised by that as well. And then that's followed by commercial energy, fugitive emissions, solid waste, and then water and wastewater. Now, the CEO of NOACA, Grace Gallucci, says they want to assess risks to public infrastructure. And as I said earlier, they want to prepare, prepare for any likely impacts. And the goal is to be carbon neutral by 2050. And they hope this plan will be approved by June by the NOACA board. Does this mean that ultimately all of us who heat our houses with natural gas, there'll be advocacy that we switch over to electricity that is then generated by green energy? I imagine, does anybody on this podcast not use natural gas to eat their house? No. no. <laughs> so, so does that mean in the future we're all going to be doing major retrofits of our houses to convert them to electricity because it's green? If 25% of the emissions are coming from houses, let's face it, heating your house is the big expense, right? Yeah, it certainly is. And, you know, of course, I, I never had gas until I moved to Ohio, and I kind of like it because you can cook, you know, even if the power is out. But, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. And, you know, heat HVA systems. System, HVAC systems are not cheap. Yeah, that, that could be a, a huge coming cost for all of us. Laura, when you and Layla, you didn't put in electric heat when you did your houses, your projects, did you? No, no. no. I actually need to go check that. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a mini split. So that is electric. That is um, in my downstairs. But we did put a furnace and an air conditioner in the attic, but it went through so many. And I will tell you, yes, HVAC anything is not cheap. But I, yeah, I honestly, I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that. I think that's gonna be something that becomes front of mind as the decades come on. It's today in Ohio. The Summit County guy did not win his bid to become Ohio's Republican Party chairman, but who did? And what was one of the first orders of business for the party under the new leader, Laura? So this is longtime Hamilton County Republican. He's the chairman, Alex Triantafilo. He's an attorney and former judge. He defeated Brian Williams, obviously the chairman of the Summit County Republican Party, who was circulating this big resolution. He wanted everybody to get punished. who didn't vote for Derek Marin. And then Jimmy Stewart, former Republican state lawma lawmaker, now leaves the Ohio Gas Association. So um, Triantafilo takes over from Bob Paduchik. The vote was conducted secretly, but he won after a single ballot with 40 of 66 possible votes. And you know what he did right after he got elected? He did look at that resolution that Brian Williams had been peddling. They did make it not so dire. No longer is there a lot of teeth there. Like you can still get the support of the state party, but it passed. Yeah, they originally wanted to censure them, not support them for four years uh, and do all sorts of things to punish them because they had worked with Democrats to pick a, a House speaker. But you're right. It, they ended up censuring them, but it doesn't really mean anything, which is the better way to go. Right. But I mean, I still want to talk about this party over people thing. And I understand that we're talking about the party caucus and the Republican Party leader. He said, I think the committee made its voice heard on how it feels. It's not my position. Their futures ought to be compromised. I think they just heard the voice of the Ohio Republican Party. And like any family, you can have your disputes. When you get back to business, we're going to try to get back to the business of defeating Democrats. Mm. And I thought their business was governing, not just defeating uh, Democrats, but this is the party talking, not the <laughs> legislature. I don't know that they would sound very different, but All they're right. splitting hairs. You're listening to Today in Ohio. 
One reason the projected costs for a new Cuyahoga County jail are so high is the number of prisoners, which is almost entirely in the control of the judges. Who's the judge costing taxpayers the most money by having more people on his docket sitting in jail than anybody else? Layla, he's been up at the top of the charts for a long time. He has been. It's it's Judge John Satula. He's been at the top of the charts since about 2004. Caitlin Durbin and Zachary Smith did this great analysis over the weekend. You know, the, the court has 34 judges, and he has has also ranked at the top for, for most pending cases, most lengthy cases, and the longest jail stays. And the, these numbers are important because if the county wants to build a new jail, they would currently have to accommodate about 1,600 inmates, but they've been desperate to reduce that number because that would mean they could build a smaller jail, obviously. Satula consistently has more pending cases on his docket than any other judge. And following this 10-month period that Caitlin and Zach looked at in 2022, he didn't show any progress in reducing his caseload. He started 2022 with 735 cases and ended October with 737 cases. And that's more than 170 cases above any other judge. And on average, he has about 77 people in jail, which is at least 20 more than any other judge. So the court's administrative and presiding judge, Brendan Sheehan, has has pledged many times that the court is you know, all in on bail reform and other strategies to reduce the jail population. But when Caitlin questioned him about what she saw in these numbers, he said, well, actually, you know, there are a lot of forces at work here that are, that are out of the court's control. He said it can take months to receive medical records, for example, or evidence testing or autopsy reports and attorneys request continuances for all sorts of reasons which delay cases. And then there are mental health evaluations and plea deals that might require one defendant to testify against another defendant. So he says it's it's not just the, the judges who are causing this bottleneck. bottleneck. Uh, but but those factors affect all the judges equally. So right. I, I could see how those factors might hurt a judge for a year or two if they have a specific trial that's dogging them. But this is year after year after year after year. Satul has always been way up there. He wasn't number one for a bunch of those years because the late, uh, was it, uh, which Russo was it? One of the Russos Joseph. was. Joseph Russo. Yeah, Joe Russo was always number one. But but I, I don't buy it. Brendan Sheehan is is peddling nonsense here. There are judges that are not moving their dockets. The other judge, Satula, Kathleen Satula, she moves her cases, man. I was on a jury in her room and she works really hard and I think makes the other judges who don't seem to work that hard look bad. Right. Well, even, you know, Judge Wanda Jones, who inherited Joe, Joe Russo's backlog docket, um, you know, and will now be passing it on to to Judge Kevin Kelly. She managed to trim that by 19 percent in 10 months. So she says that her strategy is that she meets with lawyers to work through issues and improve communication. And, and she devotes a lot of hours to trying to figure out how to get these cases moving. But but, you know, you know, in, in you know, Satula's defense, just because this is what she and had to say about it, he, he said that. Satula's judicial philosophy is that he prefers to sentence people to probation instead of prison and that his probationary periods are longer than other judges. So five years instead of two, for example. So if a person gets out on probation and then reoffends in that five-year window, they end up boomeranging back to Satula's docket and that creates this, you know, this problem for him. Um, so that, that was one explanation that Sheehan offered in defense of Satula. I, we should point out, when we first began looking at this years ago, there were a lot more misdemeanors in the jail, but the huge majority of people in the jail today are accused of or have committed pretty atrocious, violent crimes. And so it's no longer just letting them out because of bail reform. It's about moving your case along. It's about getting people to trial. There, there was a great quote in the story, I think it was that story, in which it said, the threat of a trial, there's nothing like a threat of a trial to move the case along. And so if you don't set a trial date and say, that's when we're going, nobody makes the, the deals. Nobody does what they have to do. They wait till the last right. minute. And I forget which judge it was that we quoted, but I think it was he, Dave Mattia. 
Yeah, he sets a tri- he sets a trial date, and that gets the the thing moving. They could just do that. Why don't they all just do that? Let's set trial dates and set them firmly, so that everybody does their job and gets this thing done. Hey, look, it's it's we're talking a lot of money here. Right? I mean, if you have to build a half billion or a billion dollar jail, and you have to borrow money to do it, it, it is gonna be one of the most expensive projects taxpayers have ever had a fund. So everything you can do to save money on that saves all that debt service as well. It's an important number to pay attention to. Agreed. It's today in Ohio. People who work to increase affordable housing implored him to veto it, but Mike DeWine signed it into law anyway. What is it and what morsel of hope did the governor throw to the advocates he disappointed? Lisa. The legislation is House Bill 45 that was signed by Governor DeWine on Friday. Um, There were two amendments that were added by uh, Republican senators at the very last minute to a $6 billion bill that appropriates mostly COVID relief money. And this bill is subject to a line item veto. So he could have vetoed these two amendments if he wanted to, but he didn't. But he did kind of throw them a bone. Uh, number one, the First Amendment would uh, would ban developers from combining state historic preservation tax credits with federal low-income housing credits. The Second Amendment allows, but not requires, county auditors to assess affordable housing units as if they charged market value rent. But units that claim a federal tax credit can only charge based on tenant income. So that would mean higher tax bills for the landlord that can't be passed down to the tenants. And it also reverses an Ohio Supreme Court precedent to assess affordable housing units on what they earn and not what the market value is. But Governor DeWine says, yes, he vetoed it, but he's optimistic that he can get this through next year's budget. He said the budget proposal will have a comprehensive set of affordable housing provisions, including an Ohio affordable tax affordable housing tax credit and a single family income tax credit. But with a GOP supermajority, can it happen? Yeah, what what I found instructive in the story is he said he had talked to the Senate president, Matt Huffman, and he believes that Matt Huffman will be with him on that. And it made me wonder whether the the whole approach DeWine has had to all these bills, not vetoing the natural gas, not vetoing this, is because he's afraid that if he angers the legislature, they'll just run over him because they don't need him. They could do whatever they want. They have such big super majorities. That that what the fact that he called Huffman before signing the bill tells me he's worried about the legislature. It's almost like he's asking for permission. Hey, Matt, you know, I don't like this. I'd like to take care of it. Uh, I'll sign it so as not to offend you. Will you work with me on the money? And Huffman says, yeah, sure, Governor. And then, like you said, we'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes me a little bit nervous. And, and like I said, it would have been so easy for him to veto these two amendments, which were added to an unrelated bill, really, if you think about it. So, yeah. I think he might be afraid of the legislature. We'll have to see what happens next. It's today in Ohio. The U.S. House Speaker controversy ended over the weekend with Kevin McCarthy pretty much giving away his soul to get the votes he needed. But while it was still going on, reporter Cliff Pinkard went down to Playhouse Square to ask some people who had just watched Hamilton how the machinations they saw on stage compared to the machinations going on in Washington. Laura, what did they tell him? That it's harder to reach a compromise today than in 1790, and that McCarthy should not challenge anyone to a duel, which I I think we could all take away from that show, right? No more duels. Uh, But politicians in the 1700s didn't have to worry about getting called out on Twitter or Facebook, but basically talked about things are still going on in the back room, that room where it happens. And I think that was in a lot of our minds last week. Uh, from Act Two of the play, where Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison are meeting for a private dinner, and they come up with the Compromise of 1790, where that's what allowed Hamilton to push forward his financial system and move the U.S. Capitol to Washington. So when it gets, you know, comes to getting things done in politics, a couple of people hammering out privately might work a whole lot better than the entire chamber standing and watching and voting multiple, multiple times. 
I read a bunch of analyses of the what happened with McCarthy, and you know who was in the room where it happened was Jim Jordan, mm-hmm. the Ohio congressman. He was pulling people into the room nonstop trying to negotiate the end of that. He has more influence, I suspect, than than people realize because he sounds like one of the most active people trying to get McCarthy seated. So I don't know. And who- it wasn't. I'm sure he was so proud of that. He was like quoting Hamilton in some earlier. I, I forget it was like this fall and what he was talking about. So he was probably feeling pretty good about himself. Yeah. So which character in Hamilton would Jim Jordan be? <laughs> <laughs> Madison? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. It's today in Ohio. Do we still have children sleeping in the Cuyahoga County office building in a situation that resulted in abuse and sex trafficking last year? Layla, how many children have to suffer before the county solves this? Uh, I wish I knew the answer to that. We're, we're talking about the, the Jane Edna Hunter Social Services Center, which is essentially an office building for the county's Department of Children and Family Services. In, the, in this building, children who the county has been unable to place in foster care have been basically living there. And the result is this very dangerous environment in which the kids with violent tendencies have sometimes attacked the staffers who are forced to watch over these kids. Some of the kids leave the building at will and disappear for days. Sometimes they're out there, you know, engaging in prostitution. And it's it's even been said that sometimes they take other children with them to be trafficked on the street. It's just a complete catastrophe. It's been happening for years. Finally, we there, you know, we've shed some light on this. So the county had pledged to pour $10.8 million into a contract with the Centers for Family and Children, which is supposed to reserve eight beds for these kids. But as of last week, Caitlin Durbin reports that 10 kids were still living at the Jane Edna Hunter building. The Centers for Family and Children say they're working to get their space ready for the kids by sometime later this month. They're training staff, you know, blah, blah, blah. But they, you know, they're not committing yet to when they're going to open. And in the meantime, workers at the Jane Edna Hunter building say the place is still in complete chaos. They're not sure how much more they can take of this. I mean, the social workers got a $6 pay bump to try to stem the attrition that all of this has caused. But under these conditions, is it going to be enough? I, I don't know. I mean, Chris Renee's been in office for what a week and a half, yeah. but you, I mean, we were we were stunned at the lack of action to end this last year. Right. It was it was just the administration was not moving. So Ronane's on the clock. I mean, it's not, if it's a big problem, he's not going to solve it overnight. But but he should solve this one quickly, right? Right. I mean, this should, this is like a you know four alarm fire here. I just can't believe that it's taken this long. This should be his top priority, top priority. Well, and he could still, as of now, saying, yeah, I inherited this. But like I said, he's on the clock. This has to be solved quickly. Right. This is bad news. And it's so close to, to you know being solved. I think that he could usher it across the finish line. It'd be an early win for his administration. Let's get it done. All right. You're listening to Today in Ohio. I mentioned Jim Jordan working so hard to get Kevin McCarthy elected as the House Speaker. But Lisa, why did some Republicans again nominate Jordan to be the Speaker of the House on Friday? It went pretty poorly the first time they nominated him. Well, they just, you know, there was those 20 or so, you know, hard right that didn't want to vote for McCarthy at all. And so, you know, uh, Matt Gates, the Florida Republican, uh, he nor- nominated Jordan in like the first round of balloting and then again in like the 12th round of balloting. And Gates said that, you know, there's great trust in Mr. Jordan and there's insufficient trust in Kevin McCarthy. Um, Jordan did get several votes in some rounds of balloting and he got no votes in other rounds of balloting. But if you look at the Ohio GOP, they all supported McCarthy. Dave Joyce in an interview on Fox News over the weekend said, well, McCarthy's earned the opportunity to be speaker. Bob Lotta from Bowling Green, he said he's eager for McCarthy to address inflation and energy costs, lethal drugs from Mexico. And then the newly anointed Rocky River representative, Max Miller, said 
he actually kind of called them out a little bit. He said the whole process of electing the speaker was incredibly sad and disappointing and honestly embarrassing for our party, you think? But then he urged the GOP to back McCarthy. He said that McCarthy was the only one who could get even close to 218 votes. And Jordan has backed McCarthy the whole time. I mean, you know, they've been buddies since January 6th and maybe before that. But uh, and he and Jordan is also poised to chair the House Judiciary Committee. So that should be very interesting. I I just wonder, nobody ever breaks ranks, but I wonder if anybody in the Republican House seats was disturbed by how much Kevin McCarthy gave up. Anybody at any time now can call for a vote on getting rid of him. Mm-hmm. And he he's putting these loons in all sorts of prominent positions now. I, there's a lot of predictions that we're going to have a shutdown of government, that they won't they won't approve funding and that it's just going to lock up everything that goes on. And and we've talked about stagnation in Washington before, but this could be worse than anything we've seen. Well, and I think one of the concessions, I don't know if it was still there that they would, you know, not raise the debt ceiling, you know, which is, that's insane. I mean, we know that closing down the government for a day even costs billions of dollars and affects millions of people. Yeah, it's a it it we're in very very strange times. We have been for a while now, but they keep getting stranger. And Jim Jordan is in the thick of it. We'll have plenty to talk about with him, I think, in 2023. It's today in Ohio. That's it for Monday. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Layla. Thank you, Laura, and thanks to everybody who listens. Mm-hmm.